It's a pleasure and honor to be with all of you. And I want to thank also, and especially the organizers of this conference for the kind invitation to participate in this panel and conference together with very distinguished experts on the topic. Um, and I'm sure that for all of us uh, who have the opportunity to participate in this conference, it will be a very mutually inspiring and enriching afternoon. My reflections about the topic You can hear me well, or do I have to bring it a little closer, like this? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes? Behind also? Okay, thank you. My reflections this afternoon part from my long-standing relationships with the communities of two indigenous peoples called Avahun and Wampis in the northern part of the Peruvian Amazon region and their reality. So I want to do my reflections on the ways of the example of Amazonia and the threat Amazonia has to face, nature and its people. Um, first, let us have a look on the context. Amazonia is certainly a unique natural treasure in our world. The Pan-Amazon region has a singular natural and also cultural richness. Amazonia has existed for more than 30 million years and it's now threatened by uh, collapsing. And it includes the world's largest rainforest, which is very rich in biodiversity. One tenth of all species of plants and animals known to science live there, including nearly 16,000 species of trees. The Amazon region is one of the most biodiverse regions as a whole in the world. In this unique biome, everything is connected, as Laudato Si says. Thanks to the multiple connections and interactions among the diverse species of living beings, including plants, animals, fungi, and even microbes that coexists in this ecosystem, the Amazon rainforest is exceptional and is also irreplaceable. The Amazon territory holds a great cultural diversity as well, which manifests itself in the numerous and culturally very hydrogenous, perhaps I better hold it again, or like this, thank you, populations who dwell there. More than 50, uh, 35 million people live in Amazonia, and nearly one million of them belong to indigenous peoples. There are about 400 different indigenous peoples with their own cultural identities, practices of territorial management. In addition, the communities formed by the descendants of African slaves brought to this region by force um, also add to this cultural diversity. This equally holds true for many people who live along the rivers and those who have migrated from the Andes to the Amazon basin, many of whom are small farmers or campesinos, as we say. Migration from rural to urban areas has also made the Amazonian cities very multicultural. In the Amazon region, the water cycle is the great connector. It connects ecosystems, cultures, and also the development of the territory, as is stated in the final document of the Amazon Synod, which took place in uh, 2019. The reality of the Amazon demands certainly a systemic approach. The Amazon biome is crucial for the stability of Earth's climate. <clears throat> the experts are stressing strongly that Amazonia plays a fundamental role in global water cycles. Um, in global water cycles, because the region's rivers contain one-fifth part of all fresh water on our planet. And the Amazon River, River is the largest tributary of the world oceans. Working with his research team, 
Since 1975, Carlos Nobre, a prominent Brazilian scientist, has gathered more and more scientific data which clearly prove that the rainforest and its e ecosystems play a key role in maintaining climate stability, not only in Amazonia and Latin America, but also globally. Besides recycling water very effectively, the rainforest is an enormous carbon sink, still until now in the major uh, part of the total amount of carbon absorbed each year by the different forests on our globe, the Amazon alone retains between 20 and 25 percent. These vital connections and synergies among the various parts of the vast web of life are what gives rise to the enormous biodiversity of the Amazon territory. This impressive diversity presents potential for life in the Amazon region but it also makes the Amazon ecosystem and its habitants very vulnerable. On the list of the ecoregions in the world that are highly vulnerable and diverse, uh, Amazonia is number two. And it is coming close to a dangerous tipping point. The Amazon biome is increasingly affected by multiple devastating impacts on its ecosystems. They reinforce each other and are interconnected in a negative sense. Massive operations to extract rural resource, resources resources like oil, like gold, like tropical timbers, and also the expensive monocultures are just a few uh, of the examples and they all have multiple impacts. They are generally meant for exportation. The, what they produce is meant for exportation to countries of the global north, also to Germany. The use of mercury and cyanide in illegal gold mining, especially close to rivers and other bodies of water, is e ecologically very devastating and at the same time extremely dangerous for human health. The same holds true for the pesticides and other agricultural chemicals that are used intensively and which quickly enter the water system because of the nature of the rainforest soil. In addition to this, pollution from toxic substances, for example, the oil spills in Amazonia, there is also con contamination caused by an enormous garbage amount. Here you have an oil, oil spill in the middle of the jungle. <coughs> And here you see a person, garbage thrown away from the city, but also a person in the midst of the garbage, and often indigenous are, are treated as, um, Pope Francis says, descartables, as people like garbage. What you don't use, you exclude from the city, you don't care for. The steady increase in deforestation is a major contribution to global warming. And it means for the Amazon region that the length of the dry seasons is increasing and droughts are becoming more intense. As a result, tree mortality is rising already. And that is a serious sign that the rainforest is weakening and is less able to resist the many stress factors to which it is exposed. Recent studies indicate that Amazonia ecosystems will not be able to withstand all of these impacts together and the serious damage they cause for much longer. Despite this alarming situation, during the pandemic, deforestation has still increased dramatically. This puts very much at risk both the region's biodiversity and the water cycle, which is vital for the survival of the rainforest. According to scientists, we most probably are already much closer than expected to the point of no return when 50 to 60 percent of the total rainforest could become extensive savanna with calamitous consequences, not only for Amazonia and South America, but also for the Earth's climate, which already is becoming increasingly destabilized. In the documentary Breaking Boundaries, Johan Rockström, professor of Earth System Science, together with the economist Ottmar Edenhofer, um, states with deep concern that, I quote, the Amazon rainforest is weakening 
and might start emitting carbon within 15 years. Therefore, from the Amazon rainforest and the whole region um, is lifted up the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, as it said in the final document of the Amazon Synod. Scientific studies in the region offer more and more insight into the complexity of the numerous interconnections and interactions. In Amazonia, the insight that everything is connected is not simply abstract knowledge, but it comes also from the vital experience deeply rooted in Amazonian communities, both indigenous and those of African descent. Research in the Amazon basin is revealing to us not only positive, but also negative synergies which are generated between the different parts of the environment, human action and the climate. This can be observed clearly in the case of increased deforestation and its multiple negative effects, like the ongoing loss of biodiversity. The latter plays a very important role in the mitigation of climate change. At the same time, the sustainability of the biodiversity in Amazonia is increasingly at risk because of climate variations which are occurring more frequently in the Amazon basin. Also in Amazonia, there's a clear connection between a violent attitude and physical violence towards nature and towards other persons. Because, as Pope Francis stated in Laudato Si, we only have one heart and act from it. Indigenous peoples are engaged in safeguarding Amazon territory and striving for buen vivir, good living, good life. The indigenous peoples in the Amazon region are among those most affected by what is going on. In terms of quality of life, health, respect for personal and collective rights, food security and a solid foundation for a sustainable future in the face of increasing destruction of the rainforest and the degradation of the biome. Indigenous people are very aware that the place where they live is greatly endangered and that there must be a radical transformation in the predominant culture because the current understanding and structure of the economy comes at the expense of the health of the earth and the people. In the present economic system in Amazonia, the main interest is how to get high profits in a short term without careful and integral consideration of all the impacts on the biome and its inhabitants. The final document of the Amazon Synod identifies the so-called predatory extravism as one of the main causes of destruction in the Amazon. Extractivism, which means that large quantities of raw materials are removed, especially for export, generally with minimal processing. In the final document of the Amazon Synod, it is clearly said that Amazonia therefore needs an approach of an integral ecology. The main characteristic of integral ecology is the integral and co comprehensive understanding of reality. It coincides in this aspect with sustainability, when sustainability is understood in an integral and comprehensive way. Both require a systemic way of thinking based on the awareness that everything is indeed connected, which then informs all actions. For many peoples and communities in Amazonia, this approach to reality and way of thinking is not new, as it is deeply embedded in their cosmovisions, in which all of life is understood as being in relationship. Also, the cry from the earth and the cry from the people. Um, in their perception, the cosmos is an extensive and complex web of relationships characterized by continuous interactions, intercommunications, and interdependence, interdependencies, and the flow of energy. Therefore, in the world view of the indigenous peoples, um, all are part of a web of life. The other living being and the human beings are part, but they have to be aware that also the other living beings belong to the same web of life and that they also have agency, not only the human beings. In the indigenous understanding, there is no dead matter and there are no inert beings, but everything is alive as it is full of energy, including rivers, forests, 
hills and mountains. It's interesting to note uh, that uh, the quantic uh, physics also teach us that energy is the main uh, element moving everything. The territory has a, and that therefore it makes no longer sense to distinguish so sharply between subject and object. The territory has a great significance for the indigenous communities. Here yeah, you can see. Um, this became manifest during the whole process of the Synod. The working document states, in the Amazon, life is inserted into, linked with, and integrated in territory. Um, it is also a spiritual place for encounter with God, the divine, or spiritual forces. For all these reasons, according to indigenous culture and cosmovision, the territory is not something to offer for sale. Although often economic enterprises try to undermine this conviction by corrupt practices. The cosmovision informs the attitudes as well as the modes and ways of relating with the earth and with the, each other. Solidarity and reciprocity in indigenous understanding is not only to be practiced among the people in a community and among the communities, but also in relation to the earth and the non-human living beings. This cosmovision is, as Pope Francis stated in his message to the participants of the fourth annual meeting of the economy of Francesco, of Assisi, and one can add of Clara in October uh, 2023, it is a cosmovision from the peripheries of thought. In this message, message, the Pope stresses very much that, I quote, it is not enough to think about and for the poor, but with the poor, with the excluded. This is a challenge, also in theology, to be done interculturally. Francis observes that, I quote, even in theology, we have too often studied the poor, but we have rarely studied with the poor. And he concludes, from being an object of science, they must become subjects, because each person has a thought about the world and should not be excluded from the very possibility of expressing a thought that is considered serious. In this sense, in the indigenous cultures and cosmovision, um, it's important that we note and take into consideration the concept and practice of the so-called buen vivir, good life, good living, because it's something you do actively, continuously, is intimately linked with territory and is about a good living together. It has ethical connotations and is always connected with a good practice which is coherent. Key concepts of good life in the indigenous sense are respect for boundaries, reciprocity, solidarity, and the search for balance and harmony, not only in relationship with other members of the human community and with God, but also in relation with the other living beings. An important characteristic of a truly good life or good living is that there is, I quote the final document, there is neither excluding nor excluded. And here, a full life for all can be projected, thinking also of future generations. It is a reference or a horizon to which you continue to move in community. It's a dynamic concept. It reminds us of the life in abundance promised by Jesus. And it is a fact that for many of the indigenous leaders, men and women, who are seriously threatened by different mafias because of their commitment to defend the rights of their peoples and to safeguard the territory with its forests and water sources, the inspirations, spirituality and values linked to good living are a source of encouragement, inner strength and resilience. The Inter-Ethnic Association for the Development of the Peruvian Rainforest, called IDESEP, made known publicly that in the last 10 years, till the end of 2023, 33 indigenous who had been defending the territory and forests in Peru were killed. Peru is among the countries worldwide with the highest rate of this type of crime. It is important to note here that in the understanding of the original peoples, good life is not just a descriptive term, but has ethical connotations. For 
Eduardo Gudinas, who has been researching sustainability and the indigenous understanding of the good life at the Latin American Center for Social Ecology for years. The latter is an alternative to the, I quote, conventional understanding of development and growth. Because in congruence, he says, with the holistic approach in the understanding and practice of good life, which also requires un buen hacer, a good action, the good life does not focus on accumulation of material goods. Of course, in the understanding of the indigenous peoples, a good life presupposes that sufficient material goods are available for a life of dignity. But with regard to a good life, the question of what gives meaning to one's own life in relation to others and to the earth or territory is of decisive importance. Values such as wisdom knowledge, common good and common goods, solidarity and reciprocity, also in relation to nature, are central. In a social context in which the globalized urban consumer culture with its pronounced individualism is increasingly encroaching on the living space of the original peoples, the indigenous communities are struggling to ensure that their values are not lost in their communities. Based on the understanding of good life, many representatives of indigenous peoples and organizations are critical of the concept of sustainable development. As Woodinas explains, their criticism, I quote, does not refer only to current development programs and theories, but to capitalism itself as it prevails in Latin America. It is based, among other things, on the fact that the term sustainable development is often misused for practices which are not sustainable. Markus Vogt has already pointed this out and noted that an, I quote, understanding of sustainability as a green cloak for the utopian ideas of progress and modernity, as represented, for example, in the concept of green growth, is inadequate because a critique, as Vogt says, of the capitalistic logic of profit maximization and the widespread expectations of prosperity must go deeper." End of the quote. Indigenous peoples are resisting a Western hegemony in the definition of development and progress. For them, the concept of development is associated with the history of disregard for indigenous culture and cosmovision and the great asymmetry of power in social relations. Representatives of IDESEP point out that in Latin America, the concept of, le of development is closely linked to the concept of modernization. However, according to those who propagate this development thinking, modernization means that the indigenous people should adopt the Western way of life in order to catch up with modernity and develop further. A re representative of IDESEP summarized it like this. An indigenous society has its own cultural values and ways of life and does not commercialize everything. Um, it still, but when a community does this, it was and still is considered backward looking and being a backward community, presumably too attached to tradition and therefore resistant to change." End of the quote. There's a great need here to reflect and debate with each other from an intercultural perspective on how we can continue to speak of development at present, bearing in mind the history of the term and whether this term can be filled with content in such a way that it is also meaningful and acceptable for indigenous peoples. The social teachings of the church um, have identified and named essential aspects about what characterizes authentic development. For example, um, the holistic promotion of the human being in all its dimensions, including the relationships between people and earth. To, I want to conclude sketching uh, briefly some connecting points um, or possible intercultural bridges between indigenous cosmovision and concept of good life and Christian vision of uh, earth as creation and Christian ethics in this regard. The cosmovisions of the indigenous peoples in Amazonia and in other parts remind us that in our world everything is relational, interactive and interdependent. This is, as we have seen, also reflected in the indigenous concept of good life. 
which interrupts capitalistic logic of accumulating more and more, the logic of an unrestrained consumerism. Good life, as we have seen, imply, implies the capability to live creatively with the limitations of the ecosystem, which need to be respected in order to avoid harming the systems through pollution or over-exploitation and destroying them. It is also a question of social justice and climate justice. It means less lavishness and waste of resources, less greed and striving for profit at any cost, less extractivism and land consumption on a broad scale, less exploitation of land and people, less of a throwaway culture, and pollution of air, soil and water, and more authentic sustainability, more of a coherent practice inspired by an integral ecology, as Laudato Si proposes. As Christian Bauer states, to live a good life at present on an endangered planet means to live differently. Ethically, it needs to be a good life for all, and not only for a few. In a Christian perspective, it calls for discerning very attentively the signs of our time in order to try to perceive how God's creative spirit is present in the midst of the very serious reality that we are heading towards a climate catastrophe if we do not overcome the ecologically destructive practices. Certainly, the climate crisis, as Laudate Deum says, is one of the principal challenges facing society and the global community. The effects of climate change are borne by the most vulnerable people, whether at home or around the world. It puts our Christian faith to a test. It has to prove itself whether it is able to contribute to inspire and motivate a responsible personal and common communal answer to this strong challenge. Uh, Christ um, Christian Bauer puts it like this. In the face of climate crisis and climate cat catastrophe, does the gospel prove to be a real resource for good life for all? It is the source of a new existential existentialism, which inspires a good life, not ex the expense of others, especially the marginalized and excluded and most vulnerable ones, and of the earth. Um, as it has been the case in colonialism in the past and is the case now in the so-called neo-colonialism. Dealing in a responsible way with this question is not just a task with regard to the pastoral practice, uh, but, um, and it does not concern only the ones involved in Christian social ethics, but it is a challenge for theology as a whole with all its different fields. It is a cross-sectional task in theology, practiced ecumenically, and calls for an interdisciplinary approach and collaboration, which implies also an interreligious approach. As Christian Bauer and others are pointing out, after the anthropological turn linked in theology very much with the name of Karl Rana, today we need a so-called terrestrial turn in the spirit of the terrestrial manifest of Bruno Latour. The term terrestrial derives from terra in Latin and Portuguese and tierra in Spanish. It has the double meaning of tierra as ground and soil, which nourishes plants and humus and habitat, and on the other side, the meaning of the planet on which we all live. Latour uses the two meanings in his concept of terrestrial and adds still something else. He observes that the people shaped by modernity consider nature to be something separated from the human beings and their actions. Human beings are generating culture, but in the modern view, the human beings are the ones who are able to do this. And they did it in a way that nature and culture are perceived as two spheres which are separated. In his reflections, Latour wanted to refute a mechanistic and reductionist approach to nature. With the term and concept of terrestrial, he wants to motivate people who are deeply influenced by those modern thoughts to become aware and gain further consciousness with regard to our terrestrial and, in this sense, material dependencies on the Earth and on the non-human life for our own life. So, several theologians already speak of a terrestrial turn needed in theology, a, turn, a theology done down to Earth, um, in the sense of the terrestrial manifest of Bruno Latour, which has the subtitle Down to Earth, which means to understand God as a transcendent but not extraterrestrial mystery. Niels Gregersen developed the approach 
of a deep incarnation which prolongs the incarnation of God into the deepest depths of matter. And the Christ hymns in the Deuteropoline writings already manifest a cosmic dimension of this incarnation. Uh, Thayard de Jardin also developed further this idea. Um, and I think that is something which could be followed up in an intercultural theology and would be an important bridge with cosmovisions and concepts of good life with indigenous peoples all over the world. In Latin America, Leonardo Boff, who is close to the indigenous peoples in their culture and thinking, is the most prominent among the theologians who are developing a sacramental eco-theology of liberation. Bob speaks of a crucified earth and states that in a pastoral perspective, that through the resurrection of Jesus, there has been opened up an historical existence of Jesus towards the whole material cosmos. And Jesus, in his resurrection, makes it participate in the eschatological transformation. Um, Bob reminds us that we are Earth, all of us, Adam, Adama, Earth that thinks, feels, and loves. Caring for the Earth implies, therefore, necessarily to work for an authentic sustainability in all its dimensions, the dimensions which are intertwined and contribute to reflections which then motivate corresponding practice to contribute to bringing about the so-called bold cultural revolution that are the words of Laudato Si, or the great transformation, as Uwe Schneidewind puts it, who speaks also in his book with this title of The Art, the art to generate social change. A central dimension is to overcome a culture of consumerism and throw away, and to discover that less can be more. The concept of good life in indigenous culture and tradition can be a source of inspiration if it is translated into different social cultural contexts, as it is already happening, as well as a source of inspiration certainly can be Christian spirituality. Both have important dimensions in common. For example, the conviction that less can be more and contribute to more meaning and depth in life. Laudato Si reminds us that Christian spirituality proposes an alternative understanding of the quality of life and encourages a prophetic and contemplative lifestyle, one capable of deep enjoyment, free of the obsession with consumption. Um, it also uh, reminds us that a society, when lived freely and consciously um, in this way, is liberating. It is not a lesser life or one lived with less intensity. A life lived like this, on the contrary, is a way of living life to the full, end of the quotation. It also implies to take seriously into consideration the critical observations of indigenous regarding their concept and practice of sustainability and the so-called sustainable development. And um, I want to conclude with a, a broad campaign, international campaign, which took place during the pandemic season. Um, different NGOs and also church communities gave the, the title, We Are Amazonia. And I think the a common intercultural commitment can foster among us the awareness that what is happening in the Amazon is, and its people is also concerning the people in other parts of the world. Safeguarding Amazonia and responding to the cry of the earth and the cry of the people in Amazonia needs, at this point, urgently alliances and close collaborations. Therefore, um, I also promise the people, um, the indigenous people with whom I'm in contact, that I will bring it here like an invitation, like a, a plea they have. Let us see how we can do further steps to really experience and come closer that all of us are Amazonia and that in a common collaboration, steps can be taken effectively to safeguard good life in Amazon and in other parts of the world. Thank you very much.